Uh, good morning to the South Asia station in the appropriately named Harmony Room. Um, South Asia does not make the news as often as the Middle East these days, except, of course, for astute observers, but it's uh, for many of us still probably the region of the world where the risks of uh, when there were nuclear risks uh, remain the highest. Uh, there's been a fragile nuclear stability over the past decade, and uh, although there are, just like in the case of Iran, there are some uh, signs of hope with uh, the recent meeting last Sunday, but the situation in Kashmir, for those who follow it a little bit, uh, remains uh, preoccupying. I just noted that uh, by 2030, it's not a note, it's actually a, a thought, both India and Pakistan could rank in both the two biggest two of the biggest populations in the world and two of the biggest nuclear arsenals in the world if your current trends continue. Now, I, as a chairperson, of course, will have limited time and four speakers, so I will not take too much of your time, but I will have questions myself. And one of them is, are we witnessing what I would call, for lack of a better expression, nuclear dehyphenation between India and Pakistan in the sense that India is going long and Pakistan is going short, for, uh, to, uh, to say things in a, uh, to use shortcuts. But they're both going big in any case. Um, another question, how should we gauge the Indian reaction to the recent development of the past two years in Pakistani nuclear doctrine and arsenals? And how do we assess the respective credibility as seen by the other side of uh, their attempts to checkmate each other? So to say, uh, does credible minimum deterrence, <clears throat> an expression used by all, both sides, still mean anything when Pakistan claims that it has, quote, full spectrum deterrence, unquote, and at the same time India goes for ballistic missile defense? I mean, what's the credibility of credible minimum deterrence, of the minimum part of credible deterrence? <laughs> um, finally, what, what are the chances of maintaining a de facto moratorium on testing? if both sides are actively seeking a diversification of their uh, arsenals. Well, so that, I'll, I'll have more questions, as right, of course. But, um, I suggest that we start with proceed in the following way. Um, Shashank Shoji will speak first, talking about mostly but not exclusively uh, the um, situation in <laughs> India. Mansour Ahmed will speak next, uh, will, speaking, as I understand it, mostly, although perhaps not exclusively, about Pakistan. Andres will cover, as I, uh, uh, as I understand it, mostly the ballistic missile question, inter alia. And finally, I will ask Ambassador Vigamark to give us an EU perspective, although I understand that given his position, he will focus also, uh, perhaps mostly, on Pakistan. I'm instructed uh, that uh, we only have five minutes per speaker. Um, yeah, of course, uh, none of you is going to uh, do only five minutes, I understand. So I'll, after five minutes, I'll begin doing something very annoying, which is this. This is very annoying. And, you know, the, the audience will start hating you. So, so You're I'll only looking at me. <laughs> well, all of you as well. Anyway, Shashank, you go first. Sure. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me Okay. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Um, I'm starting my timer to avoid that situation ever coming to pass. Um, I, I'm glad you opened with the question, how, does CMD mean anything? Um, and I thought I'd use, you know, we, most of us here probably know the basic trends in South Asia, in India, Pakistan, in China, so I won't rehash those. I'll just make um, a four distinct points for us to chew over. The first one is about minimalism, and um, it's defined in many ways, uh, in infinitely elastic ways, and indeed that was the purpose of articulating doctrine in terms of CMD uh, in 1998 for India as well. But one of those criteria, one of the best ones, I think, is how a state answers the question, how difficult is deterrence? How hard is deterrence to achieve? And I think by that criteria, by that criterion, sorry, both sides are, I think it's safe to say, diluting minimalism. Uh, and I pass no judgment on whether that's good or bad, I'm just making that as an empirical observation. I think they're both coming to see deterrence as increasingly demanding a task. Uh, Pakistan, uh, that being evident, Pakistan's own uh, development of tactical nuclear weapons, um, but I'll leave most of that to the other panelists. In India, I think 
that's coming to pass in three different types of pressures I'm seeing on their nuclear doctrine. And I say pressures rather than shifts or changes because at this point I think they probably are pressures more than anything else. Um, one of those pressures is um, a recognizable dilution of no first use, which of course was one of the pillars of India's nuclear doctrine uh, in 1998, was articulated by Indian nuclear thinkers well before that point. Um, there are many, many manifestations of this, but I think one of the interesting ones was uh, someone like Jaswant Singh uh, standing up in Parliament talking about India's nuclear environment. I think it was earlier this year in the spring, although someone can correct me if I'm wrong, and saying uh, uh, India needed to reassess whether no first use was still serving its interests. Now, the reasons uh, Indian thinkers have for reassessing or seeking to dilute no first use are many. Some of them have very clear strategic reasons to do with preemption and signaling to Pakistan. Others simply see this as a, a simple uh, uh, perceived low-cost way of upgrading India's uh, nuclear posture without actually having to change anything physical. Um, but, I'm, but that's clearly what I'm seeing in internal uh, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, Indian debates. Now, whether that actually feeds through the level of policy, I think, is another question. I think another pressure I'm seeing is a shift on massive retaliation. Massive retaliation is another pillar of India's nuclear doctrine outlined again in 1998. Uh, it, it's been reasserted many times since, I think most forcefully um, in a very complete speech given by Ambassador Sham Saran, uh, uh, even though he was out of office, uh, he reiterated that massive retaliation was a core part of India's doctrine. But I think we are seeing more and more debates emerge within India about uh, whether this is uh, sufficient for India's needs, whether it needs to consider um, graduated or flexible response, limited nuclear options, and all the doctrinal apparatus that goes with that. Um, again, uh, these so far I would emphasize are at the level of debates. So uh, that's, that's part one. The second point is the relative influence of Pakistan on the one hand and China on the other. I think one of the questions that comes up again and again, particularly in a more general audience than this one, I think, is what's more important to India? Is, it their, is their program India-centric or China-centric? Sorry, excuse me, Pakistan-centric or China-centric? And I think Indians are prone to emphasizing China for the obvious reason that they see it as a larger peer competitor. And, of course, it's also a way of deflecting Pakistani complaints. But I think the answer is a little more complicated. Um, which is to say the line of control in the international border with Pakistan is where Indian elites see nuclear weapons as both most usable, uh, most likely to be used, uh, but also most easily deliverable. And so the focus in the Pakistan relationship is on those doctrinal issues I mentioned. That is, how do you counteract Pakistan's attempt to lower the nuclear threshold? How do you respond to limited nuclear use? Uh, how does massive retaliation fit into this? But... With China, uh, I think China is where India is most concerned about strategic stability. And so India's emphasis on developing a triad of a mature triad of delivery systems, including the recently launched uh, uh, SSBN, the recently tested, retested Agni 5, are both efforts at increasing the survivability and reach of India's nuclear forces with respect to China. And so doctrinal developments perhaps are leaning towards uh, uh, Pakistan, and postural developments or capability developments in the direction of China. Um, since I'm running out of time, the very final point I'll make is on the role of momentum and technological drift. I think I'm seeing some interesting trends, uh, interesting questions over whether India's scientific agencies are perhaps pushing aspects of the program forward, even where they run counter to minimalism, and even where it's not clear to me that there's strong political direction or a strong overarching political view of where India's nuclear doctrine should be headed. And the most interesting aspect of this is in the missile program, in uh, uh, the repeated statements by a DRDO that it seeks to merv India's missiles, that Agni 5 and 6 will both be merved, without any particular sense to me whether this flows from an understanding of doctrine or whether it's simply scientists seeking to cross the next frontier with little sense of the strategic second, third, or fourth order consequences. Um, and I'll I have a few other points, but I'll stop there since I might start inducing glass tapping otherwise. <laughs> Thank you very much. I see that deterrence works, in fact. It does. <laughs> you, you said very clear red line. Mansoor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Detrice. Uh, I'd like to offer my views on uh, Pakistan's pursuit of uh, tactical nuclear weapons. 
and the rationale behind uh, doing so. Uh, of course, in 1998, Pakistan had to respond to India's nuclear tests, and it has been primarily prompted to go for tactical nuclear weapons in response to India's strategy of proactive military operations, also known as Cold Start. Now, our deterrence posture was essentially meant to deter India's conventional superior forces in addition to India's nuclear threat. But in, uh, in after the Cold Start Doctrine emerged, it was clear that Pakistan's uh, nuclear forces in the current posture were not sufficiently effective to deter India from launching limited strikes, punitive strikes against Pakistan. So as part of its overall strategy of credible minimum deterrence to maintain an, the credibility of its deterrent posture, Pakistan had to fill the gap at the tactical level uh, so as to preclude the possibility of any limited war in the region. And that's why we uh, went for tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and then, of course, in some ways, it is also a question of capabilities leading, leading to intentions. Uh, in 1998, both India and Pakistan had claimed to have carried out tests of sub-kiloton tactical weapons. So the capability was there on either side, of course, in the first place. Uh, secondly, um, of course, for some, Pakistan's pursuit of tactical nuclear weapons might seem destabilizing. But from a Pakistani viewpoint, I think it's meant to enhance our deterrence posture and supplement the conventional forces already in place. Uh, Pakistani decision makers have carried out uh, uh, different exercises in the field and in the National Defense University that is primarily designed to cater the threat at the conventional level. Uh, having said that, in my view, Pakistan would only uh, deploy and employ tactical weapons in case the conventional defense breaks down at any critical point. And of course, our spatial and territorial thresholds have been uh, defined, uh, although our nuclear doctrine is not very transparent, but it is well understood that Pakistan lacks strategic depth. And in some, in some areas of um, the critical population and communication centers are less than, are between 15, 50 to 70 kilometers of the international border. So even a limited punitive conventional strike by eight independent uh, battle groups from the, <coughs> Indians, from the Indian side would uh, be, be, be deemed critical to Pakistan's defense, uh, such as Lahore is right on the border. There are some other areas, Sialkot and other areas. And even an Indian incursion inside the desert areas to a depth of about 10 to 15 kilometers would not be acceptable to the people of Pakistan because they paid a heavy price building this capability. Uh, however, this is not to suggest that Pakistan would is going for a war fighting strategy. Uh, Pakistan does not have the amount of fissile material required for developing hundreds of tactical nuclear weapons for war fighting. And in case uh, Pakistan chooses to uh, use these weapons, it would only be uh, in, in the situation where deterrence is deemed to have failed. And then, of course, there would be no prospect of escalation control. In my view, once the threshold is breached, then it's not just tactical weapons uh, like the 60-kilometer Nasser, then it's going to be every other weapon in Pakistan's arsenal that would be used in self-defense. So in my view, um, uh, building tactical weapons uh, is, uh, should be seen as Pakistan's exercise of the right of self-defense because, of course, there were gaps in the, uh, in the deterrence posture, which uh, India was seeking to uh, exploit. And uh, this has been a very rational, a very logical response in order to uh, preclude any possibility of aggression at any level. And that is, in that context, the uh, concept of full-spectrum deterrence should be understood. It's part of the overall strategy of credible minimum deterrence. It's not like that we're going for war fighting. And, of course, there are certain developments on the other side, like the Indian development of the Prahar missile, although uh, they have not openly said it, but it's very evident that it has a tactical role in, you know, for the battlefield and is nuclear capable. And India has the amount of fissile material that, uh, although they don't need to build tactical weapons, but the capability is there. And of course, capabilities lead to intentions. So um, uh, Pakistan's overall posture, to sum up, is uh, basically meant to enhance uh, uh, the credibility of its minimum deterrent. It's not meant to raise the stakes in the region. And uh, Pakistan will be forced to respond to whatever is seen as destabilizing for strategic stability. 
we are not the first ones to go nuclear. Uh, Pakistan was not the one, is not going for nuclear submarines armed with ballistic missiles. We see um, BMDs as inherently destabilizing, and Pakistan is not going for a BMD system also. But we'll, uh, it will be forced to take adequate countermeasures to maintain uh, the credibility of its own uh, deterrence posture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mansoor. Now we're broadening slightly the perspective Andreas. Thank you, Bruno. And let me see if I can be the first one that forces you to tap the glass, uh, because the others have been extremely compliant. And compliance is, of course, very, very important, especially in, in South Asia. Um, so I want to talk – well, first of all, I just want to say that I was quite surprised by Marx and his team's invitation for me to participate on this particular panel, because – I haven't really dealt with South Asian issues for a long, long while. Uh, the last project I had uh, was for the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to go down to South Asia and try to see whether or not there was an appetite uh, for a fissile material cutoff treaty in whatever form or shape. Uh, and in my final report, and I spent a few weeks down in, in the subcontinent, and in my final report I did write back to them and said, you know, in my opinion, you should definitely defund all, all activities, Norwegian activities in South Asia because there is absolutely no appetite for this whatsoever. So you're wasting your money. It was harsh to my friends and colleagues in, in South Asia, but I, I felt my assessment at the time was relatively right. It was, it was a hugely depressing uh, uh, experience, but at the same time very, very enlightening uh, for my future um, perception and understanding of, of the region. Now, <clears throat> then I understood that um, what they really were after was an initiative that was led by the Department of Energy and is still going on, uh, and they call themselves the Colombo Group, which is essentially track two of retired Indian and Pakistani officials that are coming together looking at whether or not it's possible to get the two countries to agree on some sort of verification measure, in this case looking at retired ballistic missile systems. Uh, because the, both the Indian and the uh, Pakistani arsenal and some of their systems are aging quite rapidly. Uh, systems are already being brought out of service. So the idea was if they are going to be retired <coughs> and sent to the scrapyard, <coughs> sorry, why don't you just um, put them under some sort of bilateral monitoring regime and try that way to, to build, um, to build uh, some sort of trust and confidence between the two countries? You have to start whenever you, you do something like that, and, and I've, I've done this now um, in several regions of the world, including in, in Northeast Asia. I had a, a project there once uh, with, with one of those two governments. I'll let you guess which one. North, obviously. Um, you have to understand what the strategic context is and, and, and how any proposal that you formulate would be received by the, the, the people that you're trying to work with. Uh, in the Northeast Asia context, it is very, very difficult to come up with a formula that works because of the extreme distrust and, in some cases, even hatred that exists between the two parties. They went through a, a largely a, an extremely upsetting uh, civil war. They had the partition of their country. Essentially, they are one people, but... Uh, those wounds are so deep; it's almost unbelievable when you when you when you when you unravel it and when you look at it. In um, in on the subcontinent, however, the situation is very very different. Uh, sure, there are uh, a lot of rivalry and sometimes even hatred and a lot of distrust between the two countries. And I mean, a lot of it obviously is the British fault because the the uh, the uh, independence of India and, and the partition could have been handled uh, in a better way, if we put it like that. And the, the fallout from the partition is still very much alive uh, in the region. But at the same time, there are so many cultural links between the two countries. Um, it's, it's almost like someone told me when Israelis and, uh, Israelis and Palestinians meet in track two, so they're surprised by the fact that they go up and they ask, oh, how are you today? And how are your children? Long time since we saw each other. And you get surprised because they are, you know, they are rivals and they are enemies, but they're also close. I was surprised to see in Pakistan, for instance, that 
the favorite TV shows that are on, on TV is all Indian Bollywood things, which they are obsessed about. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, and when they meet, the relations are extremely cordial to the to the point of teasing each other. You can sense you can sense the uh, the tension underneath, obviously, but it's a different working environment, and and it's something that you can work with uh, between the two countries. But obviously, you cannot dismiss the fact that in the 1970s uh, we had a we had a series of wars that were extremely serious. They led to a, a very painful split of, 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 of uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh. You had an emerging dynamics within Pakistan that, that forced them or drove them towards developing a, a, a nuclear arsenal, mostly to um, mostly as a self-defense, as a, as, as a way to protect their, 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 their fledgling national state against a much larger strategic rival. But of course... That rationale for weapons possession has changed, and has changed, I think, in both countries. Uh, since the 1970s, the reasons why Pakistan developed weapons in the 70s are not the, the same reasons as why they keep them today. I don't know exactly how it's changed, but I feel that there is a difference between the two. Pakistan, though, mostly views the weapon as an equalizer. But it's also, um, as someone said, it also has a philosophical value, which I think is, a, is an underlying value, but it's, it also has something like that. Um, in the West, sometimes you hear people refer to, to it as the Islamic bomb. Um, I'm not saying that a majority of people in Pakistan would feel that you know, this is primarily an Islamic bomb, but there are some that, that, that feels like that, and we should be aware of those people. In India, of course, the possession of weapons are, are, are completely different. Uh, for them, it's more giving them, you know, it's more about power, it's more about technologi technological development, it's more about legitimacy, it's more about sitting down on an equal playing field with the, with the permanent five. Sometimes you do hear that, you know, uh, it's developed vis-a-vis -vis the, the Chinese uh, in particular. I mean, when India developed its, its new missile, you saw on Indian TV, they called it the China Buster uh, highly uh, sensitive language was used on Indian TV to describe this new weapon, which I'm sure Beijing felt uh, happy about. Is it time? Yes. Okay. I'll come down to the point. I think, though, after my rambling speech, that there are two areas where the two countries could work. Ballistic missiles is obviously one of them, because despite the alleged sensitivity about it, we came to agreement quite quickly that it could both be done and it could be done in a technical way. Uh, I suggested in the beginning that the easiest way to do this is simply to blow the missile up and you, you stand on a test stand and you, and you watch it explode. But it was a bit too easy for both the Indian and Pakistani counterpart. They wanted something more. So this group developed a, or I'm continuing to develop a, a rather more elaborate verification protocol, which isn't strictly necessary. But that's a positive development because if you go down that route, you can possibly go even further and look at other things. The real, the real proposal that I would like to put on the table is because of the close relationship between India and Pakistan in Vienna. Sometimes they find themselves on the same side of the table, especially when it comes to resolutions that, that, that um, uh, refer to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Suddenly it, it is, as my dear friend uh, from India said, or my esteemed colleague from Pakistan said, you know, we, we don't want to support any language on the MPT. It's a, it is a cordial relationship between the two embassies there. And this cordial relationship um, is, a, is a marriage out of necessity rather than, than love, I, I, I would say. But that's something that can be used, and especially so uh, when it comes to uh, an India, a, a purely subcontinent dialogue on, on nuclear safety. I think this is something that can be achieved uh, because when I raised it uh, with your respective agencies um, on the technical side, it was something that they said, sure, this is something we can do. Um, and that's it. Really? Yes. Damn. <laughs> I'm sure you have time during the Q&A to expand on this very interesting suggestion. Ambassador? Yes, that will help. Thank you very much, Bruno. Um, 
Um, in fact, in preparing for this panel, I came across your paper that you wrote about a year ago on, on uh, Pakistan's uh, nuclear program, and I, I must say I find very little that I can disagree with. Um, I will be speaking here in a so-called personal capacity. I haven't run my comments by Kathy Ashton or anyone else in the EIS. Um, and I'd like to try to broaden um, the discussion a little bit. Um, I'm making four or five points. Um, first of all, the title of the panel is Nuclear Issues in South Asia. Um, of course, it's generally assumed that any nuclear issue in the in, on the subcontinent can be reduced to the Indian-Pakistan relationship. And any solution must therefore also be a bilateral one between Delhi and Islamabad. And as a result, few, if any, attempts have been made to introduce any kind of outside solutions or mediation. I think the previous speaker just indicated some of the difficulties also with coming with any kind of outside uh, initiatives that would probably be rejected I would still argue, though, that the nuclear issues in South Asia cannot be reduced to a bilateral logic only. And here I think we, the international community, including the European Union, have perhaps been sometimes a little bit too easy about just reducing this to a bilateral question. Um, of course, as was said by the first speaker, uh, India's security policy, uh, including its nuclear program, is very much driven not just by a concern with Pakistan but also with China, which, by the way, is an increasingly close ally of Pakistan's. Pakistan's nuclear program is also, whether it likes it or not, subjected to other regional considerations, in particular its close relations and dependency on Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. And while Pakistan is careful not to criticize Iran's nuclear ambitions in public, it is concerned with the regional consequences of Iran's nuclear weapons capabilities, which, if realized, would invariably lead to a Sunni-Shiite nuclear arms race, putting Pakistan in a very awkward position indeed. Add to this a growing energy dependency between India and Iran, a sense of competition between Pakistan, India, and Iran over who can exercise the most influence in Afghanistan, and a trust deficit with Pakistan's historically, historically uh, most important ally, the United States, concerning how to fight terrorism and the U.S.-led initiative to provide India with civilian nuclear technology. Add all this together and you have a very complex regional, I would argue, also international mix. Now, as I said, my point is not to try to diminish the importance of the bilateral PAC-India relationship, which is undoubtedly essential. Nor am I trying to play up the involvement of so-called foreign <laughs> hands, which is often used to distract from the real issues. But I would like to question the assumption that somehow only India and Pakistan are responsible for nuclear security or the lack thereof in South Asia. It is a regional issue and it is an international issue. Uh, just look at the CD conference, the Fissile Materials Control Treaty, and the Nuclear Suppliers Group. These are international, multilateral questions, very much impeding on the bilateral India-Pakistan relationship. Now, just a few very general facts that I think you always need to recall with South Asia. It's the least economically integrated region in the world. It's also the most populous region in the world. Moreover, the subcontinent is the only region with two nuclear armed states sharing a border of which only part is regularized and the other part, the so-called line of control, subject to major territorial dispute. A prominent conference participant told me yesterday that those who are in the know, and I assume that must mean Washington, are in fact more concerned with the nuclear conflict in South Asia than on the Korean Peninsula. Be that as it may, one might assume that a great deal of attention is therefore going into understanding and trying to contribute to an improved security climate on the subcontinent, question mark. Third point, Pakistan has clearly done a great deal in terms of its nuclear security 
as has India, I'm sure, although I'm not in the know very much about India in this respect. It has upgraded its security arrangements. It is part of the nuclear security summit process, the global initiative countering nuclear terrorism. Um, Pakistan has also quietly been working with the IEA in upgrading the safety of its civilian nuclear installations, mostly with financial support of the United States. This has all been well documented by, by Bruno and others. Here I would like to add that EU has played a small part through the, the Joint Research Center, which works closely with the IEA on, on these programs and has also been, been to Pakistan. This being said, um, and for obvious so-called national security reasons, Pakistan's nuclear security doctrine still remains very opaque. And we basically have to take their word for that they have sufficient nuclear security. The United States and others seem content, so I suppose we have to be content as well. But I think more could be done in terms of providing transparency on both sides. Here I would like to come to the point of EU, EU-Pakistan that I was asked to, to address. And very briefly, I think here we have been doing some work on export control with Pakistan now for quite some time. Uh, this goes back to an initiative taken by the, the previous um, uh, special representative on, on, on uh, disarmament, Annalisa Janella, who I must say was, was quite active at, at one point um, with regard to Pakistan. I mentioned the nuclear safety um, work, the IEA and the uh, Joint Research Center. Uh, and I'm glad to, to, to hear, to understand that there is an interest on the side of Pakistan in, in working with the CBRN Centers for Excellence. And I would strongly encourage uh, Pakistan to continue with that and also for the, for the EU side to try to look for ways, not just for Pakistan, of course, but for the whole, whole region. Again, it's somewhat interesting that there's no, to the best of my knowledge, CBRN centers yet in the pipeline for South Asia, despite the fact that this is one of the world's hotspots in terms of proliferation. Uh, I would also highly recommend the continuation of this panel and the work that I know some of the think tanks, uh, both SSS and, and the Center for Strategic Research has, has done and others, CIPRI and so on. In fact, I'm sure the whole consortium has already worked on these issues. But I think there's much more to be done in terms of um, so-called second, second track uh, approaches. Um, a non-proliferation dialogue is prescribed in the EU-Pakistan engagement plan that was agreed a year and a half ago um, at the level of the High Representative um, and the uh, then Pakistani Foreign Minister. I think the EU should use its so-called comprehensive approach, and here, of course, I'm not just speaking of missiles and, and nuclear weapons, but the comprehensive approach involving a broad set of, of instruments, also on the development side, including trade, um, in approaching a country like Pakistan, but also South Asia in general. Uh, this is not currently the case. Non-proliferation has been sort of put on the back burner, although we have so-called WMD clauses in um, many of our more recent cooperation agreements. Now, I would also point out that a country like Pakistan does not respond very well to conditionality in the strict sense. Um, trade preferences have proved an important incentive for Pakistan to sign up to international human rights conventions and focus more efforts on their implementation. But I'm not sure this would work with respect to, to uh, nuclear issues. Um, yeah. Um, let me skip the next point. Now, also just for... For background, I think it's important to note that there's very little debate in, in a country like Pakistan against, I, I can't speak for India, um, and a very limited civil society engagement. And this is where I come back to the need for, 
for more contacts. Um, uh, there's almost no public debate preceding any any decision. In fact, I am not aware of any discussion on, for instance, how many how many nuclear weapons um, does a country like Pakistan really need? Of course, we have um, hearsay, we have speculations, and so on. That that uh, considerations are, and as you heard from the two gentlemen speaking about the doctrines, um, a need for uh, quite a few more more uh, uh, nuclear weapons. Finally, if I may, Chair, say two words on the civilian nuclear program in in Pakistan, but I think this also goes for the for the region, which is very energy hungry indeed. And as those of you who who are familiar with the situation in Pakistan, it's a, quite a desperate situation as far as energy resources. Now, China, there are currently three three reactors, providing a, quite a small, I think it's only about 2% of the overall energy uh, supply coming from, from these three reactors. China has just signed a contract for two new reactors to the cost of almost 10 billion U.S. dollars, um, but here I must note some concern that these reactors are planned to be only 25 kilometers from Karachi, very near the coastline. And as you noticed, perhaps, although we didn't feel it here in, in Brussels, I think there, was, there were two major earthquakes in Balochistan just a week ago. Um, that is northwest of, of Karachi. <clears throat> and I think we have to realize that there is a risk in Pakistan, like in many other countries, there are earthquake prone of a Fukushima scenario. Furthermore, the technology used for these new reactors, which are grandfathered or according to, to China and Pakistan under, under NSG rules, is largely untried, and my understanding is that they have not even been used by China itself yet. So this would be a kind of test, test case. Again, there is no major civil society or green movement questioning the investment in nuclear energy so close to a, a mega city like Karachi. And I know some of the Karachiites themselves um, may be excused for not paying attention to, to these nuclear reactors near the so-called paradise point. Um, in Karachi, you have more urgent concerns concerning the lack of security in the city and the ongoing operation to try to tackle the nexus between criminal, political, and terrorist groups in Pakistan's once paradise-like largest city. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador, for your very frank comments, and also thank you for broadening the discussion. At the risk of undermining deterrence, as you can see, I did not uh, object to you going way beyond your allocated five minutes, but since this is an EU-related uh, conference, I thought it would have been very uh, undiplomatic, if not uh, outwardly rude, of me to, to interrupt you. Um, many things have been said, and I will, will not give my own comments, but I'll have at least two questions for this panel that you feel free to take up after the uh, audience has this opportunity to, yes, uh, uh, I just want to make two comments before you, ref meanwhile, feel free to refine your questions. Um, Mansour said that uh, capabilities lead to intentions. Uh, in South Asia, both Indians and Pakistanis are very keen on trying to persuade us that, uh, oh, no, we're not doing like the U.S. and the Soviet Union did during the Cold War. We have been informed by what they did, arms racing and all that. We're smarter than that. Uh, actually, I wonder uh, how much will actually uh, capabilities drive intention on both on both sides. And uh, a reaction very quickly to what uh, Andrew has said about prospects for confidence-building measures. Uh, it, took, uh, the, it took NATO and the Warsaw Pact 30 years to agree to uh, conventional uh, CBMs. And uh, uh, as I can see, um, I mean, we're, we're not there yet exactly uh, in South Asia. So uh, can we, is there any reason why we should be optimistic in that regard? I have first a question from Mark Fitzpatrick. Meanwhile, I'm taking, and meanwhile, I'm taking notes of uh, others. Uh, I think we'll take three, four questions. Uh, Greg, um, yes, we'll go in that order. So, okay. Yeah. First, Mark. Ambassador Wigemark uh, mentioned uh, the German Bruto territory's very good paper uh, on Pakistan for the EU consortium last year. 
uh, I agreed with Bruno's conclusions that uh, more than nuclear uh, security, the problem of nuclear terrorism, it's the problem of the expanding arms race. I think Pakistan's record on nuclear security is, uh, is pretty good. Uh, it's not so transparent, but it's far more transparent, actually, than India's. Yes. Um, but it's the arms race. And I'm, and, and I'm, it, I'd like, you know, I'm very enthused still by Dr. Zerbo's presentation yesterday about the CTBT. We haven't talked about that. And I hope, Andreas, this wasn't part of your – you didn't look at the CTBT confidence building measures, maybe. Is CTBT – a possible way of helping to restrict the arms race. Uh, uh, Mansoor mentioned that uh, that India has a nuclear-capable uh, prahar, but it, I don't know that it has a warhead that is miniaturized enough for the prahar. Similarly, I don't know that Pakistan's uh, uh, Nasser uh, has a warhead capable of fitting it. Uh, a CTBT uh, would uh, would help to keep uh, these capabilities uh, within bounds so that uh, you can keep it a credible minimum deterrence and uh, have a deterrence uh, that doesn't lead to a, a war fighting role. Uh, Greg Thielman, Arms Control Association. Um, Mansoor, there were Two things that you said that didn't seem quite consistent when you were describing Pakistan's attitude toward uh, tactical nuclear weapons. One was you stressed that it would only be in the event of the failure of conventional forces to uh, constrain a, an Indian attack or whatever. And then you also stressed how close major urban areas are to the border. Now, it seems to me that the, the proximity to the border means you have to have very early first use in order for it to be feasible at all because... If not, then uh, all of a sudden major urban areas are occupied by the Indians. You obviously can't use p tactical nuclear weapons on top of the, the Pakistani cities. So having had a lot of experience in NATO, seeing how the U.S. Uh, was driven to early first use by worry about those 22 Soviet divisions and, and the relatively narrow band of, of Germany that had to be defended, could you try to reconcile for us that, that, uh, those two things? Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Am I audible? Hello. Can you? Okay. Um, actually, I'm just going to demonstrate. This is my individual intellectual. Uh, Okay, I just wanted to demonstrate on uh, nuclear deterrence and its role during the Cold War and then somehow compare with the South Asian case study. Uh, I mean, we understand that nuclear deterrence did prevent total war internationally. That is the empirical evidence. And we understand that nuclear deterrence did prevent total war between India and Pakistan. So we talk about deterrence, no war, and then peace. In South Asia, we talk about deterrence, probability of high probability of war and risks and no maximum peace. So can we talk about stabilizing the region, maximizing possibility of maximum peace and minimizing probability of any kind of war? And secondly, how that would be possible through bilateralism and multilateralism? Bilateralism so far failed. It did not work out. We experienced, and that is the empirical evidence. And I would encourage uh, Wigmark, since he is in Pakistan, and we can actually initiate some positive initiatives ahead so that we can bring India on table and we can actually bring our house on more transparent ground so we can actually work out on, on this. And the second important um, issue is related to civil society. How we can strengthen civil society debates. I completely agree with you, but I think Pakistani domestic uh, academic institutions need to take a lead. Since my personal experience, I was in the UK. So in the UK, there are actually public is quite well aware about nuclear weapons technicalities and nuclear weapons program and what actually <clears throat> Um, results would, would nuclear war bring. But in Pakistan, common public does not understand technicalities involved in nuclear weapons programs. So I think we need to uh, um, take a lead in this regard. And finally, I think um, that's it. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Salma Shine from King's College. Uh, I have just two quick questions. Uh, first from uh, uh, Mr. Joshi. Uh, what's in your opinion about the operational uh, or uh, maintenance or effectiveness of Indian's naval submarine? Because recently we uh, had the, uh, um, an incident of uh, sinking of Indian submarine due to the uh, uh, faults in its weapon system. 
So, and my second uh, question is to uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, how do you view the naval developments in Pakistan, sp in specific to the 700 kilometer sea launch cruise missile, uh, within the framework of deterrence or CMD, whatever you want to say? Uh, and how do you view this technolo the technological developments made in specific to the Bobber cruise missile within the framework of command and control? Thank you. Thank you, Tariq Raf. I had a question to Ambassador Wigemark. You mentioned nuclear security in Pakistan. Um, and my question is a little bit broader. The Pakistani Taliban are terrorizing the country on a daily basis, and this, poses, this puts stresses on the guardians of civil and military nuclear facilities. So what can the EU do to help the Pakistani state deal with this threat um, and you may also mention the energy crisis, and you commented on the, the possible safety questions regarding the Chinese reactor. So my question was, would an alternative be to supply EPRs uh, by Arriva? Practical issue. And a question to uh, Mansoor. What is the Pakistani position on the FMCT? Is it a position of principle on stocks, or is it a transactional position? Because some senior people have suggested that if Pakistan is given an India-type exemption, they will withdraw their, uh, they will join cons consensus at the CD to start a negotiation on an FMCT. So which is it and why? Thank you. Mm. Thanks very much. Lots of questions. I suggest, I suggest we go in the same order to, um, to tackle those questions, then we have a second round. Please go ahead. Change up. Sure. Thank you. I'll address uh, Salma's question first on um, submarines. Yeah, I think there is there is reason for concern. I mean, the accident we saw a month ago wasn't the first accident on Indian submarines. It was one of the one in a series. Um, we also saw India refuse access uh, to Russian engineers, um, perhaps a fear that they would uh, manipulate evidence on site of any Russian uh, involvement. But I mean, nonetheless, there's a lot of opacity around that as well. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there's a, there, are, there are question marks over um, uh, operational effectiveness of an indigenous submarine as well. So I think, I mean, you know, beyond saying that we there are legitimate concerns, there's not much more that we can say, other than perhaps to point out that I don't see India beginning deterrent patrols for a very long time indeed. So there's a long lag time here. It's not as if, you know, I think some people confused uh, the launch of the, of, of the Arihant with uh, the immediate commencement of operational patrols, and I think that's a, a long way in the future. Um, on the question about um, your, your two points, one of them about deterrence, one of them about um, uh, civil society, on the deterrence point um, and deterrence preventing war in both the Cold War and South Asia, of course <coughs> it's worth restating the rather obvious Indian point that um, in South Asia one of the underlying problems is Pakistan's ongoing support and sponsorship for non-state armed groups and that that's one of the underlying causes of the destabilizing atmosphere that Mansour talked about. And I think that's something that hasn't been mentioned yet and should be because, of course, it lurks under the surface. It recurred again with last week's attack in Jammu and Kashmir. And it, uh, you know, the, the prospect of a Mumbai 2 is something that hangs over Indian thinking about possible nuclear use. On your point about civil society, I'll only say that um, I did spend a good a fun few hours uh, placing nuclear bombs over Delhi and Islamabad on Alex Wellerstein's nuke map, which I think is a very interesting tool for thinking about the human effects of nuclear weapons. And, I mean, it's one of the ways in which perhaps, you know, we can, we can think about some of those effects. And finally, on, um, Greg, your point about early pressures on early first use, I think there's just one caveat to that, which is Indian thinking about uh, offensives into Pakistan, so-called Cold Start Doctrine or whatever, whatever we choose to call it now, um, our, the thinking is precisely to avoid uh, cities and avoid population centers, which are, of course, very close to the border, but there are also places close to the border that are not cities, that are not interior lines of communication. And one of the concerns I have on the tactical nuclear weapon side is that at some point, um, you know, Mansour talked about um, uh, tactical nuclear weapons being designed to preclude aggression at any level. And, of course, nuclear weapons, in my view, can't preclude aggression at any level because at some point, uh, as India calculates and assesses the nuclear threshold, it will view a certain level of threshold as being non-credible. And so we run into the problem of when the pressure for early first use becomes so great, uh, it will actually com 
encourage the breakdown of deterrence by persuading India that this is a non-credible red line, that it has been set so low it is not sufficiently credible to dissuade India. And so the issue for me isn't so much Indian assaults on population centres, which of course Pakistan can't rule out and has to be concerned about, but instead whether India sees certain types of red lines as being simply non-credible by virtue of where they've been set. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so Thank you. Uh, I think I've got a long list of questions to answer. Uh, okay, just, um, I'll just I'll begin with the comment about what uh, my colleague here said about non-state armed groups as a justification for uh, India coming up with uh, Cold Star Doctrine. I think it's high time that the world appreciates the fact that Pakistan is facing a 9-11 every day. The armed forces, the people, you have to be there to actually feel it. And no rational actor, no rational decision maker sitting anywhere in Pakistan would want to promote terrorism across the border. It doesn't make any rational sense. And of course, Pakistan can come up with its own long list of uh, alleged Indian involvement of terrorist activities in Balochistan and elsewhere in the country. So coming back to the original uh, list of questions. Okay. How much is sufficient? Well, I only speak for myself. The Indians are talking about a triad comprising 400 warheads. And if you, you can make your own guess, Pakistan has nine different types of ballistic and cruise missiles uh, that would be distributed amongst the three strategic force commands. And if you were to allocate a hypothetical number of 10 warheads for each system, it would amount to about 90 or 100 anyway. So that's barely sufficient. The current levels of assault stocks are barely sufficient to meet that, uh, and that number. And in order to have a triad, which I believe is very important for strategic stability in the region, we need to have more. But of course, there would be limits. It's not going to go on forever. And uh, my assessment is about around 200 warheads would be sufficient from a Pakistani viewpoint of having a credible deterrent. Of course, uh, Prahar and Nasser uh, and CTBT and miniaturization, of course, testing is required. But my assumption is that Pakistan, uh, like other countries, has developed this capability through hydronuclear testing and hydrodynamic testing. Uh, of course, I am not uh, privy to any classified information, but uh, I, tend, I tend to believe that uh, Pakistan would not have made a claim regarding Nasser had it not had the technical means of miniaturizing warheads up to that extent. Uh, if there are doubts about the credibility of such a claim, then I think that should settle the problem altogether about tactical nuclear weapons. Um, yes, very, very first uh, early use. I'd like to emphasize and clarify that Pakistan will never resort to first use uh, in the, uh, right after the breakout of hostilities. We have adequate, sufficient, conventional response in place that would be employed to meet the threat at the conventional level, and a series of military exercises in the field, such as azme no have been conducted, designed to cater the threat at the conventional level to the cities and other critical points at the border to meet the Cold Star threat. However, Pakistan will resort to first use when it is clear that the conventional forces are close to breaking down, breaking point, and they are no longer able to defend the country and the critical points. Of course, then our nuclear threshold would be crossed anyway. So then it wouldn't be a question of uh, escalation control. The tripwire here is the conventional defense that would, whether it would be able to hold such an attack or not, and if it fails, then it's going to be everything. It's not just Nasser, all other weapons because it's a question of our survival. It's a question of uh, having invested in this capability for over 30 years, because half of our country was dismembered in 1971, and we will, the people of Pakistan will, would never accept something like that happening to us again. Um, of course, uh, and this, I would again reiterate, would only be in case of a complete breakdown of conventional defense, conventional forces. Um, Naval developments in Pakistan, of course, uh, we are building a triad like the Indians. 
but i don't think that uh, we pakistan navy inaugurated a naval strategic force command uh, in 2012 but there are no ind clear indications that we are going for a ballistic missile submarine or a nuclear submarine uh, having said that pakistan has an indigenous cruise missile program we are building a naval uh, version of the land attack cruise missile the babur and my personal assessment is that probably we would have nuclear tipped naval versions of the babur on board some naval platforms at some point but of course it's not clear whether it's going to be some of the aip equipped conventional submarines most likely or some other naval platform on the fmct well i take the liberty of saying that our position on the fmct of course is driven by uh, by the asymmetry on stockpiles but is more geared towards gaining time for producing more plutonium which is required for miniaturization of warheads which is required for uh, the different types of uh, delivery systems that we are developing and our plutonium stocks are extremely dismal about 150 kilograms of weapon grade plutonium compared to uh, a huge amount on the indian side a lot of which is unsafeguarded reactor grade plutonium which is not separated but of course it is there and it constitutes a threat so uh, and here of course i'd like to bring in the question of uranium constraints it's again that pakistan would not go on producing material indefinitely we would continue to produce material up to a point where we are comfortable that we've reached a stage necessary for enhancing the credibility of our deterrent posture and of course that would be quantified i don't know what that number is but that's not going to go on forever and of course uh, it's driven by an operational military requirement because of the developments on the other side and uh, there is a question of uh, addressing the uh, asymmetry in stockpiles i mean the indo after the indo us nuclear deal the threat perception has ex in increased exponentially on the pakistani side <laughs> uh there are huge stocks of uh, the indians are expanding their uranium enrichment program uh huge stocks of reactor grade plutonium is there which is unsafeguarded the indians are opening up new reprocessing plants uh and uh, adding another production reactor uh to their existing capabilities through war 2 so of course those uh capabilities are growing up there is expansion and the separation plan under the indo-us nuclear deal has legitimized india's right to produce more material in the future so we are mindful of that and the decision makers in pakistan would have to factor in all this to decide their position on the fmct thank you, thank you. as i said uh, that's why i wrote to the ministry there is no point funding any more initiatives thank you for making my point no, but I mean, this is very, very serious. Um, obviously, um, this is the main reason why we're not getting any traction. It's because the countries, in fact, I would say both countries are not convinced that uh, their stockpiles are, are enough. Um, as one, um, I believe it was a Pakistani um, ambassador once told me, it's easy for a country like the United States to advocate this when they have a a nice fluffy pillow to rest its head on, whereas we rest our heads on a, on a rock. Um, when we have a pillow, we might talk. And, you know, that's the attitude. We have to deal with it, uh, as we always have, but we have to deal with it. I mean, that's, that's not going to change. Uh, on CBMs, um, a word of caution for those who, who want to do work on the subcontinent. It's, it's, uh, it's not advisable often to come in and, and say, you know, I have this great uh, invention that we Europeans invented during the Cold War that I would li like you to, to apply. Uh, India and Pakistan is actually the most CBM upped region in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about it, I think they have two or is it three hotlines now? I think it's two. Two hotlines. Mm. So they, they don't use them. Uh, th th that's my point. So, I mean, after, after the first crisis, they installed the first hotline, and, and uh, because the Europeans said this, this a hotline really worked for us, it will work for you too. But it stopped it too low. So, when the next crisis arrived, uh, communication started to come through the hotline. Uh, what are you guys doing? Maybe it's time to uh, take a breather here. And uh, the, the other side thought that we were dealing with disinformation. I mean, this is 
if you don't trust the information. Someone is sitting on the other side of the hotline, and if you don't trust the information that is coming through, it is of no use. So essentially they were thinking then, you know, probably some, some guy like me, European advisor, came in and said, let's install another one and see what happens. Uh, I, <laughs> I, you know, so I'm saying, you know, we have to look at... Uh, we have to, to apply the right knowledge and the right lessons from Europe because Indians and Pakistanis both love to say, look, you can't apply this on, on South Asia because this is a unique context. But face it, you're, you're very, very selective when it comes to Western philosophy and concepts because although you don't embrace the Western concept of uh, CBMs, uh, you do embrace uh, wholeheartedly the Western concept of deterrence. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit selective on the subcontinent, but it's a bit picky about what you, what you choose to embrace and not. Uh, on the CTBT, though, uh, as a possible way of, of um, having collaboration, I, I, you know, I think it's, CTBT was a victim of circumstances in, in so many ways um, because of the, the negotiations about the entry into the force clause and, and, and how how it became what it became. I mean, first you started to talk about, the, the first drafts talked about the number of stations, uh, or if you had stations. There, re, there is a reason why there are no stations in India, for instance, because then the Indians said, we don't, you know. So they removed the stations from the India to facilitate entry into force. But then, you know, developments up, diplomatic developments happened, and we ended up with this. But I think both countries, at the end of the day, uh, are quite, quite supportive of the notion. I mean, on balance, you know, there are obviously any country is a, is, a, is a very lively, you know, you always have a very lively internal debate. So you'll always have fraction in, inside it. And I think perhaps it's more fractious on the Indian side than it is on the Pakistani side, I think. Um, but even on the Indian side, my, my reading, which is a bit old now, we're talking 2009, 10, but that then was, we're talking about the 50 50 split, really. Um, but I do think that uh, they are keeping the option open because, you know, you might want to do some more political signaling. And sometimes you hear on the subcontinent uh, some people raise the fear of the other trying to go the extra mile in developing fusion weaponry. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, if you go big, you know, not kiloton but megaton range, you definitely want to show that off somehow. Um, so I think for political reasons, uh, it might be difficult to get traction on um, CTBT issues. I've suggested that maybe Pakistan take steps to uh, at least build its station and perhaps uh, put it online, even though they haven't signed, uh, as, as, a, as a way of showing that they're supportive of the treaty and the, and the concept that then, and the idea without actually signing up to the legal norm. Uh, but I understand that... Um, they're not even willing to take that step. Uh, but as I said, my knowledge is a bit dated. might have evolved since then. Thank you. Last question. Thank you. For, first of all, um, following up on CTBT, I'm uh, glad that, uh, that Mark Fitz Fitzpatrick raised this. Uh, I, I was thinking about this actually yesterday, listening to the morning panel, but it somehow got lost in the, in the shuffle. And, um, uh, but I also appreciate the, the explanation just given by, by my colleague here on the panel, Andreas, about some of the difficulties. But I think this might be one, one avenue to, um, to explore because we all know the dynamic of, of the testing and what happened in, in 98, um, which leads me to, to the question of nuclear security. Um, of course, so-called jihadism, nuclear terrorism, etc., is, is a threat, not just in Pakistan, but in, across, across the world. Um, uh, but let's recall that that was not the initial driver for the nuclear arms race as we see it today in South Asia. Um, uh, Pakistan, India started developing its, its program in the late 40s. Pakistan started in the 60s, 70s, um, and it was only after the testing uh, in, in 98 that this came to be full-blown, and I don't think it had anything to do with terrorism. So I think terrorism is something that has been added as a, as a layer. Um, and again, as I said, we can only take Pakistan's word for this. 
and Pakistan's credibility, unfortunately, is not that high internationally. I happen to think that, that it's, um, uh, it's not as low as, as sometimes um, said, and we have to find ways, which is why I also pointed to civil society and so on. I think it's in Pakistan's interest to engage civil society more, to have a more open debate. You have a very vibrant uh, society and free media today in, 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 in Pakistan. Uh, and also in other parts of, of the subcontinent. So it would be in Pakistan's interest. Now, what can we do as EU in terms of energy? Um, well, we've had something called an economic crisis here in Europe, but the European Investment Bank, for instance, just granted 100 million euros for a major hydro power project in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa about two weeks ago. Um, hopefully, this will be now taken up by by the Pakistani authorities. It's something, the project that also the, the German uh, develop, uh, Investment uh, Bank for Development is, is working on. Um, Pakistan is essentially, I don't want to go into the whole energy issue, but it's lagging more or less 20 years behind because of poor, poor planning in the, in the 1980s under, under Zia ul Haq, who's responsible for a lot in Pakistan today. We see the results in terms of so-called radicalization and so on. <coughs> But my argument here, again, coming back to what, what the uh, United States and others are telling us, that um, perhaps the nuclear security concern is a little bit exaggerated. And this, there are plenty of arguments still to, to be concerned with, with the nuclear arms race, the subcontinent. Uh, terrorism isn't the main one by any, by any stretch. Um, and here I would also make a pitch for not just the EU, but the international community in general to be as supportive uh, as possible of the attempts on both sides. Again, if we see it primarily as a India-Pakistan dynamic um, of the talk, the so-called resumption of the composite dialogue uh, some two years ago, which have you know, received some, some serious setbacks, first in January this year, again on August 6th with very serious incidents, but that both sides here exercise Restraint, I think they have. I think Pakistan showed a great deal of restraint in, in January. I think the current prime minister, at least in Delhi, has shown a great deal of restraint. He just met with his colleague Nawaz Sharif in New York two days ago. And by the way, on hotlines, I, I, uh, I'm not trying to <laughs> undermine your point because I'm sure there are plenty of different hotlines, but as far as conventional warfare, the so-called DGMOs speak to each other every Thursday, or so we're told. The um, problem is that sometimes, you know, the information comes in afterwards. Um, they may not be able to control certain elements on both sides of the border, I would argue. Um, and it's a much more complicated picture than, than uh, what it's sometimes uh, portrayed as. So I think we as EU shouldn't just leave it to the United States to, to be supportive of bilateral improved relations between India and Pakistan, which would be much more outspoken uh, and uh, supportive of this process. And in fact, since we are the foremost example of regional integration in the world, we should set an example. I'm not saying you're absolutely right that importing solutions to any region outside of Europe saying that this is how you do it mm -hmm. doesn't work. But there are lessons to be learned and, and uh, movement on trade liberalization uh, in South Asia, in particular between India and Pakistan. Uh, has shown some promise in the last year or two. There are a number of obstacles, but this is the only way forward. I always say that the European Union should not be Pakistan's largest trading partner, it should be India. And it's inevitable. It's going to happen. You know, maybe not in our generation, but, but sooner or later, because there's so much binding these two countries together, much more than separates them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to have a second series of questions. Time is limited, unfortunately, so I encourage um, participants to keep their questions as short as possible. Dr. Ali, you were first. No, y yes, you're high. Dr. Ali. Um, shall I just ask? Uh, you can hear me. Microphone is coming. Well, those behind might not. Um, Go thank ahead, you. Um, the ambassador referred to some of this uh, in his presentation. My question to the panel is, given the asymmetric linearity, I see that I'm sure you do too, linking Pakistan, India, China, the United States, and Russia. It's asymmetric, but the linkage exists. How can you separate 
dyadic structures such as India, Pakistan, or India, China, for that matter, and say, we will address this one in isolation from the chain. Can you do it? Is it realistic? Is there any precedent? Has it been done? Uh, I'd like to hear. Mm -hmm. Also, how can you separate the military, strategic, nuclear, tactical aspects from the wider political context in which these aspects become visible and important? Thank you. Thank you. Adil Sultan. Thank you, uh, Bruno. I can make a full presentation, but I know, uh, yes, I know the limitation and the deterrence, the value of deterrence, yeah, yeah I come from that region. But uh, if you allow, I'll just be very, very quick in uh, just highlighting some of the issues and uh, to make it clarify. Uh, first, about credible minimum deterrence. Minimum, as Pakistan has said, is going to be a dynamic concept essentially based on what the other party is doing. It cannot be quantified. The second about the concept about the credibility of the... Again, the credibility is to ensure the value of deterrence, again, based on the actions by, uh, being done by the other party. So this doctrine or the posture of credible minimum deterrence would remain there, but you cannot uh, make it static unless the other party continues to uh, develop new, uh, new, bring out new scenarios. Once we are talking about Pakistan, India, I think there is a need to understand the South Asian nuclear complex situation. It's not like the Cold War model. Yes, that is a good reference point, but it is not essentially the NATO model or the Cold War model. There are several dynamics associated with it. Uh, about the CBMs, I'll just be quickly highlighting this. We need to understand, CBMs can work if the interests of both parties are mutually interdependent. I respect the Indians may have the different political objectives, but they need to be very clear with whom they want to engage. Because the proposals that are being offered by Pakistan since 1999 India continues to reject on the basis that Pakistan is not their primary concern. So if that is the kind of approach, CBMs are unlikely to work. Uh, I'll just give you an example of the last bilateral dialogue in which Pakistan did offer some additional CBM measures, and that was in the context of post-Fukushima, that we can have nuclear safety-related arrangements between the two countries. And we can have uh, cooperation on uh, benign civil nuclear uses like medicine, agriculture. Even those small CBMs were rejected on the similar pretext that it is not going to work, it is not relevant in the South Asian context. So this is the dynamics. About the non-state actors, I'll just make a statement. Yeah, it's a short statement. Sh uh, should we allow the non-state actors to guide the behavior of nuclear weapon states? I don't think so. That is a reasonable approach. Uh, on FMCT, it's not transactional. That's it. Thank you very much, Bruno. Thank you very much. For those who don't know you, you should have, could have introduced you as being from the Strategic Plans Division of Pakistan. Oh, of, everyone knows you, but still. Uh, the gentleman here, yes? Gotcha. I'm sure I'm not alone in the room in feeling deeply unhappy about the idea of a natural transition from conventional warfare to tactical nuclear weapons if the conventional warfare is not going your way. Uh, warfare is always a chaotic environment, uh, and particularly when it's not going your way. Uh, I was made very conscious of this problem 55 years ago when as a young National Service second lieutenant in Her Majesty's Army, I was put in charge of uh, ferrying atomic cannons across the Rhine uh, and I was asked to write an essay on the uh, uh, use that I would make of the tactical nuclear weapons at my disposal. I still have that uh, essay, and it is deeply embarrassing. Uh, I knew nothing whatever about what the, were the appropriate and inappropriate uses of those weapons. And that relates to the whole question of command and control of those weapons, about which we've heard nothing today. Uh, I, I would like to be reassured that the world has changed since the British Army of the Rhine in 1957, and that uh, in the modern Indian-Pakistani confrontation, there are really proper 
command and control arrangements in place so that even in the chaos of war, everything is going to be done sensibly. But I doubt it. <clears throat> Thank you very much, sir, for that question and personal testimony. I would have said it. I'm tempted to say technology has changed a lot for better, but human nature and the nature of organizations may not change that much. No, I have five, four other people before you, and I'm afraid we may have to close it soon. Uh, the gentleman. Siri not available. She is not, <laughs> she is not available. Uh, you were there. You were next, yes. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for giving me the floor. I find that I seem to be the only one who's had anything to do with the Indian government who I'm uh, in this uh, whole audience. Uh, and you are, please. I'm Ambassador Sheel Khan Sharma. I used to be Indian ambassador in Vienna, but now I'm retired. I also served uh, as Secretary General of SAC, um, which is a South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, where India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, and Maldives are members. It was set up in 1985 and where all these countries have agreed to do cooperation. I just thought others don't know. Uh, my uh, point was that uh, nuclear issues, uh, the title, I thought that we'll discuss uh, nuclear issues, but uh, like in Bollywood films, no matter what is the theme, the item song has to come. So then the item song started of India, Pakistan, deterrence, and, uh, and this whole intractable discussion between whether you are right or I'm right, whether who, who has got what, who has got what. When they could not do bilaterally, you are talking about it. Uh, I'm just telling, please don't take it amiss, sir. Uh, and uh, I, I sympathize with the panel who are not from uh, the region uh, for, uh, for their disclaimers, uh, for their caveats that they do not know very much, but they've just, they will try and make an attempt. And I sympathize with you, Mr. Vigmark, because you are ambassador in Pakistan. So you have limits to what you can say because your host country is treating you very well. And Pakistan, I know, is a wonderful host. I have seen their, you know, their hospitality. So if you have been to Pakistan, you will not say things against them, nor will I, because I have been to Pakistan. So with that, let me just uh, answer one or two things which Mark said. On the CTBT, you know, the 1999 uh, Lahore Declaration, which President Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was also Prime Minister then, and the Indian Prime Minister they signed. They made a joint declaration. Uh, it was in the, in the joint statement, but independently about moratorium and nuclear tests. So it, this is the closest they had come to a kind of a mutual uh, agreement on n nuclear moratorium. There have been a number of CBMs uh, which have been in operation. Uh, and uh, in 2002, January... Sir, can I ask you to... Be sure that we don't but have a lot. Gave me the floor very late, uh, that's because and, uh, <coughs> that's because there were. Uh, I just tried to bring in, uh, the please, other uh, pr please frame your question. Thank you. I tried to bring the other perspective because otherwise this whole thing. I'm afraid, one unfortunately, side. we don't have much time for perspective. Well, thank you. If you have a question, please go ahead, sir. No, uh, if you don't give me the perspective, thank you. You have the authority. You know, you are. Uh, Oh, yes, thank you. you. don't come from the UK. Doesn't matter. Hello? Does it work? Yeah. Uh, yes, I have uh, uh, two actually very short comments uh, that build on things that have been said. Uh, and this allows me uh, to save time. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, you need a bigger framework. Uh, yes, you need to include China. You need to include uh, 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 the emerging... Oh, Oh, India-China standoff in Southeast Asia, uh, you need to include Russia, and also including uh, the technology transfers uh, uh, from Russia to India, uh, technologies uh, uh, that Russia uh, also uh, uh, denies to China. So it's a very uh, much in the center of the whole thing. Uh, so it's, uh, so uh, I would actually submit uh, the trying to frame uh, the topic as South Asia might be are quite counterproductive. Uh, oh, oh, in many ways we cannot solve uh, too much if we just try to talk about, say, uh, South Asia itself. And the second point, uh, it's actually quite uh, uh, sad for me uh, that when I look uh, like at all the discussions of, 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 of the India-Pakistani uh, nuclear relationship uh, that I see kind of... Um, uh, the uh, 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 
Oh, 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 the nuclear strategies uh, that were discussed and developed uh, during the Cold War. So it's exactly the same stuff uh, that we all actually uh, used to work on. And in my view, uh, that's actually quite negative, primarily because we see uh, once again uh, that nuclear weapons uh, do have a lot of value. Yes, and there can be strategies and things like that. So in the broader global context, uh, 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 that's undermining really Article 6 and uh, nuclear disarmament. Thank you, Nicolas. Yeah. I apologize for cutting you short, all of you, but that's in the interest yeah. of time. We're still in about. Well, no. That, you made your comments very clearly, Nikolai. And finally, the gentleman here. I'm afraid I won't have time for the other two persons who wanted to take the floor. Um, I've not been serving uh, with the Rhine Army, um, but I've been living in a chunk of Germany that is famously known as the Fulda Gap and was one of the places where tactical nuclear weapons would have been deployed in any case. I'm still wondering, um, when you say... Um, that um, Pakistan would only use their tactical or any nuclear weapons in case that the conventional um, forces are about to break down. How um, the doctrine for the use of um, sub-strategic systems, especially when they're um, on carrier systems that have a range of 60 kilometers, so basically battlefield weapons, uh, how that reconciles. Um, I mean, um, they, they're going to be in a so zone of war and commanders at one point or the other will have to make the decision if they run the risk to lose them or to use them. Um, that's basically where it comes down to. And I, I don't see um, the value in, in doctrine if you say you're going to only use them uh, when, you're, uh, when your conventional defense is about to break down. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have uh, a couple of minutes per speaker to uh, respond to it. By the way, just, uh, so, I, don't, I don't think anyone mentioned the fact that Pakistanis, to the best of my knowledge, are adamant to not call them tactical or battlefield. They say it's short-range, low-yield. Short-range, low-yield. And they, they are adamant to not call them tactical. Uh, in reverse order, Ambassador. Thank you. Um, on the question of tactical um, nuclear weapons or low, short range, you know, low yield, feel free to call uh, <laughs> I deliberately <laughs> stayed away because I knew Absolutely. that two of the panelists would, would each represent uh, um, their respective perspectives and, and their real experts uh, on their uh, respective nuclear doctrines. But just for the record, I fully share the concern expressed by you, sir, and also by the Indian colleague, indirectly, I think, um, about this, this particular aspect. Um, in fact, I share the concern with nuclear weapons in, in general, but there we are, they're there. Um, and of course, in the heat of the battle, and I think the, the analysis that has been done, the independent analysis that is available by various civil society members and, and others uh, on both sides of the border. There is such a thing as a sort of track two dialogue going on among scientists in particular, uh, although I think it's far too easily dismissed both in Islamabad and Delhi, as I understand it. I think these things should be taken seriously because I think we are on extremely dangerous ground when we start to think in tactical terms of nuclear weapons. Um, and that is an experience also that I think we, uh, we made here in, in, in Europe uh, and elsewhere, although the INF Treaty is, is, is something that, that is there, and perhaps India and Pakistan would need to consider something along those lines as well, because I think as, as much as I appreciate very sophisticated analysis of uh, nuclear deter deterrence at a tactical level, I think in, in real life, chances are that it will, will break down. Um, and we all know, by the way, also that a major reason why Pakistan is engaging in this in particular right now is, of course, it's uh, the conventional disparity with India. Uh, um, and, of course, India being a much larger country, larger population, higher growth, economic growth rates, Pakistan lagging behind every year. Mm -hmm. So even if Pakistan were to put even to double the uh, 
18 percent or so that's officially now going to um, uh, to the military. Uh, it couldn't keep up um, with um, with India. So I think this is also a, a dynamic we we need to consider when we look at the uh, at the region as as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, Andrews? Thank you very much. I think I'll constrain myself to uh, one observation, and that is that when I did uh, tell the Norwegians not to fund the FMCT, I meant the FMCT, but I am, I'm very, very encouraged by my countrymen and I suppose the European Union's view that more work needs to be done in South Asia. Um, and uh, one thing that I would suggest, since uh, Gunnar so kindly have uh, said that the EU should do more, uh, is uh, that the EU funds more, uh, um, you call it civil society, I would call it strategic community interact uh, exchanges between Europe and the two principal players in the country, because we need to start somewhere, and that's one way of doing it, where we can discuss broad issues like the ambassador tried to do, uh, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, I am still learning, uh, and I want you know to learn more. And I think the focus needs to be on in India, um, because my impression is, with respect, uh, that the Pakistani strategic communities is very coherent and very well polished and very well uh, presented in the way they present their arguments, in the way they, they think. It's very European-oriented in, in many, many ways. Uh, the Indian strategic community is incredibly diverse. And it's on a level that just doesn't exist in Islamabad. And it's difficult to uh, make sense of all the competing organizations and interests that are at play in, 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 uh, in New Delhi. All the centers. I mean, there are, <laughs> there are so many of them. Uh, but I think that, that would be a good step to go down and try to sort, you know, see who is who, uh, what interests are being represented, and talk these issues through. Uh, and if the EU would be willing to, say, fund an umbrella organization uh, of sorts to do this in, in South Asia, uh, I think that would be an interesting uh, concept. Yeah. Oh, there is a consortium. Is there? <laughs> oh, we'll try to do that and do it. Consortiums work. But thanks, thanks for the ID. Uh, Mansoor? Yeah. Uh, very quickly. Uh, the justification for Pakistan to go nuclear was that, that nuclear weapons would serve as a weapon of last resort. And tactical weapons fall in the same category. I would tend to agree with you that there would be formidable challenges on command and control. We've been told that the decision to deploy and employ these weapons in times of a crisis would be taken at the highest level by the National Command Authority. And they've factored in such contingencies, and they've planned for such contingencies. Whether or not they're able to do that, whether or not yeah. they are, they would need to pre-delegate authority, I'm not privy to that. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. The same challenge would apply to the naval nuclearization, which is going on in South Asia. A nuclear submarines coming up, um, maybe they pose more challenges than this one. But the point is that, which needs to be reiterated, that the very reason why Pakistan built these weapons was because we could not defend ourselves at the conventional level because of the gross asymmetries, which are increasing. So if we would not use these weapons in, as a weapon of last resort, then they would be serving no purpose. We've bared sanctions for 30 years, and the people have uh, paid a price in terms of the economic development and opportunity cost to have a defense which is considered as invincible because of this capability. I mean, that's the idea which has been sold to the people. So if you don't use it, if, there, if, it, if the situation arises where the, the, where the uh, existence of the state is threatened, and that is where the doctrine comes in. We don't have an official doctrine, but the thresholds are very well known. The territorial, the spatial, the military thresholds are there. If they are breached, if the thresholds are triggered, then eventually Pakistan will need to employ these weapons in, in uh, self-defense and knowingly that there will be massive retaliation. That is a factor which is known, and that has been factored in uh, to absorb uh, massive retaliation and respond uh, appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, Mansour. Thank you. Just uh, two uh, points to conclude on. First of all, on tactical nuclear weapons. Um, uh, on Dr. Ahmed's point just now about decisions being taken at the very highest level, 
I mean, you know, five years ago, we saw that when President Zardari tried to initiate changes to Pakistani nuclear doctrine, he was very quickly and summarily rebuffed by uh, those in control of the arsenal. We also saw that in other areas of policy making over the past five years, including his attempt to place the ISI under the control of the Interior Ministry and so on. Um, I think civil military relations in Pakistan are moving in a, in a positive direction. The election of the first re election of a civilian government, excuse me, the first culmination of a civili elected civilian government's term was a very historic moment. But if I had a show of hands of everyone here, everyone in the larger conference here, as to how many think in, uh, Pakistan's civilian leaders would have the final say over Pakistani nuclear weapons, I think uh, we, we know what the answer to that is. It's simply incredible to expect that civilian leadership has the final authority on this subject uh, until we see further costly signals of civilian uh, command over other areas of core Pakistani security decision making. Uh, a final plug on that subject, if anyone's interested, I also have an article on uh, Pakistan's tactical nuclear weapons in the Washington Quarterly of the most recent edition. Finally, uh, just to conclude on, to return to my original point about minimalism, we're discussing a lot of non-proliferation solutions to this problem, as we should, this being the conference it is. We talked about the CT, uh, CTBT, we talked about CBMs and so on. But again, I come back to the issue of what minimalism is, is essentially how one answers the question as to how difficult, how demanding deterrence is. And I think one of the things we can do is make the case, as many uh, Indian and Pakistani writers have done in the past, that actually they can inflict unacceptable damage on an adversary using quite limited means. And my own belief is that India does not need uh, ballistic missile defense or MIRVs or uh, nuclear-tipped cruise missiles in order, to, in order to achieve the capability to inflict unacceptable damage. And that strategic argument may be more ultimately persuasive to the strategic communities and policy elites, certainly in India, not sure about Pakistan, uh, than directly conventionally non-proliferation arguments, which of course shouldn't be forgotten, but may be less effective. Very much. Before we conclude, Mark wanted to have a word. I just want to say that uh, if he is agreeable. Okay, certainly. Um, we ha we're going to have a very short break. I was uh, challenged yesterday by Andreas to uh, uh, find uh, jokes to make about India and Pakistan and to the tune of how many Indians does it take to dismantle a Pakistani warhead, how many Pakistanis does it Don't take do to dismantle. It. And I have the answers. Uh, in the interest of time and political correctness, uh, I, will, I will abstain. So I'll see you at answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say that in discussion on South Asia, the bilateral dimension of India-Pakistan talks uh, is a very crucial dimension. They have been attempting, it works, sometimes it slips down, and the situation in the subcontinent is so difficult that despite the best intentions on both sides, and particularly from the Indian side, from the Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, it has been very difficult to really get onto an un uninterrupted and uninterruptible dialogue. So. Given that kind of a reality, this uh, external discussion of the nuclear situation in South Asia, uh, I find, has certain limitations because, A, it seems to uh, get uh, skewed perspectives. There has to be perspective from both sides. It seems to also, in the skewed perspective, seems to encourage a particular perspective because as uh, uh, the nuclearization of the subcontinent led to no first use from India's side and first use from Pakistan's side. Now this inconsistency is being addressed by both sides somehow or the other, but they have not come to a stable situation. Pakistan keeps saying that uh, they are driven by India's conventional superiority and India says, India says that they are worried about Pakistan's uh, alliance with terrorism and cross-border terrorism. Pakistan's denial of cross-border terrorism further creates problems. So these are the, the, the difficulties uh, in, in subcontinent. And they can be resolved through dialogue, through talks. Uh, but uh, the external parties will have to show a greater understanding of the situation. India is a very treacherous democracy. So people don't talk uh, clearly. 
and uh, that since just because they don't talk it doesn't mean things don't exist like nuclear security it, a point was made that india talks very little about it it is because they are under threat of terrorism and any defense about nuclear installations which they talk if they openly speak they are opening it also to terrorists so that's why they are contrite but that doesn't mean that these things don't exist same way about their doctrine they are very clear uh, that there will be massive retaliation but they don't want to have first use so uh, now to further pick holes on this doctrine is of course the right of the country so there are a lot of indians who are objecting to this and there are the others who are objecting to it uh, so uh, this is the problem uh, but they try to explain uh, like I, i would say that india's position is well explained by shamsher and the Nas uh, nuclear uh, national security advisory board chair who spoke in april uh, uh, this year and he put down the the basic position and india doesn't want to be provocative about uh, its nuclear problem thank you